About three years ago, on a forum that I was reading, David suddenly came onto the forum, and I was like, wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here is a clarity of understanding that is just so refreshing. So I'm absolutely delighted that you're here. Please come forward. Of all the teachings given by the Tibetan master DK to the world through his amanuensis Alice Bailey, he regarded the teaching on Shambhala to be the most important. Yet this teaching forms only a small part of what he gave us. Why did he put this ahead of his much more extensive teachings, including the teachings on the seven rays given in five large volumes? Shambhala, we know, is a very sacred place. But why would DK regard the teaching on Shambhala to be so important? Shambhala is not on the map. It is not described in our geography books. In the great Kala Chakra commentary titled Vimala Prabha, the stainless light, we find Shambhala described. From this description, artists in Tibet painted pictures of Shambhala. These paintings, or tankas, follow the description given in the text very closely. The artists are not free to use their imaginations and just draw anything they feel inspired to draw. The text describes Shambhala as a large kingdom having eight divisions. All the Tonka paintings of Shambhala show these eight sections. Since we cannot see the kingdom of Shambhala, we do not know if its eight divisions are to be taken literally as geography or symbolically. We cannot see Shambhala with our physical eyes any more than we can see the chakras or energy centers that are described in Sanskrit books as being located in our subtle bodies. These two, like Shambhala, have been depicted by artists in paintings based on descriptions of them. Paintings of the chakras were published in Arthur Avalon's 1918 book, The Serpent Power, made from the descriptions given in the Shat Chakra Nirupana. The chakras are depicted as lotus flowers with varying numbers of petals. These chakras have become quite familiar to students of the esoteric teachings. If we look at the painting showing a lotus having 12 petals, students will immediately recognize this as a depiction of the heart chakra. It is well known that the heart chakra has 12 petals. The heart chakra is described not only in such Hindu tantric texts as the Shat Chakra Nirupana, but also in C.W. Leadbeater's widely read book, The Chakras, and again in the Alice Bailey writings as having 12 petals. If we look carefully at the picture of the heart chakra from the serpent power, we notice a small chakra at the bottom of the painting. According to the Sanskrit commentary, it is located below the central hub of the heart lotus, and it is necessarily painted there. But two verses quoted in the commentary place it inside the heart lotus. As we see, it has eight petals. Yes, eight, just like the eight divisions of Shambhala we saw. The paintings accurately follow the texts, and the connection they allow us to make is clear. The connection between Shambhala and the eight-petaled lotus within the heart chakra. In fact, the heart chakra is described in the Buddhist tantric texts as having eight petals, not twelve petals. Not only Buddhist tantric texts, but also Jaina texts and some other Hindu texts describe the heart chakra as having eight petals. So the implication is also clear. Shambhala 
with its eight divisions is intended to represent the heart chakra. Shambhala is a sacred place because, in some sense, it represents the heart of our planet. In an ancient commentary on the secret book of Dhyan, quoted by H.P. Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine, planet Earth is likened to a living body. The commentary speaks of the water of life that flows around and animates Mother Earth's body, saying, quote, it gets purified on its return to her heart, which beats under the foot of the sacred Shambhala. This beautiful quotation, with its metaphoric language, is worth quoting more fully. In the first beginnings of human life, the only dry land was on the right end, the North Pole, of the sphere, where it, the globe, is motionless. The whole earth was one vast watery desert, and the waters were tepid. There, man was born on the seven zones of the immortal, the indestructible of the Manvantara. There was eternal spring in darkness. But that which is darkness for the man of today was light to the man of his dawn. There, the gods rested, and Fohat reigns ever since. Thus, the wise fathers say that man is born in the head of his mother, earth, and that her feet at the left end generated or begot the evil winds that blow from the mouth of the lower dragon. Between the first and second races, the eternal central land was divided by the waters of life. HPB adds a note here. This water is the blood or fluid of life which animates the earth, compared here to a living body. The quote continues. It flows around and animates her, Mother Earth's body. Its one end issues from her head. It becomes foul at her feet, the southern pole. It gets purified on its return to her heart, which beats under the foot of the sacred Shambhala, which then, in the beginnings, was not yet born. The Tibetan master DK, in some of the new information on Shambhala that he gave out, tells us of the coming of the hierarchy and the founding of Shambhala about 18 and a half million years ago. The movement for the spreading of the secret doctrine, he says, is that old. He speaks briefly of the hierarchy's first organization of the teachings of the mysteries on the physical plane and, quote, the first outpost of the Shambhala fraternity. He goes on to point out some of the changes that these teachings have gone through over the ages in response to the changing needs of developing humanity. He describes the gradual development of the teachings and their culmination in the mystery schools of antiquity. Quote, Gradually the teaching was reorganized and the curriculum increased. Little by little the mysteries were developed as the people became ready for them until we have the marvelous schools of the mysteries of Chaldea, Egypt, Greece, and many others. All these teachings and all these mystery schools, DK tells us, were inspired by and originated from Shambhala. But what is the teaching of Shambhala itself? How is the teaching that would lie behind the teachings of all these mystery schools formulated there? The teaching of Shambhala is known as Kala Chakra. It was brought out by an Indian yogi who undertook a journey there more than a thousand years ago. Without ever reaching there, he was met part way by a teacher who gave him the texts. He was able to bring back the Kala Chakra Tantra, 
abridged by King Manju Sri Yashas of Shambhala from the full Kala Chakra Tantra written down by King Suchandra. He also brought back the Vimala Prabha or Stainless Light Commentary thereon, abridged by King Pundarika of Shambhala. It is from this text that we learn how Kala Chakra became the state religion of Shambhala. The Stainless Light Commentary on the Kala Chakra Tantra describes in an entertaining story how the 35 million Vedic sages of Shambhala took up the practice of Kala Chakra. Suffice it to say that they did so, and Kala Chakra then became the state religion of Shambhala. They received the Kala Chakra initiation from King Manju Sri Yashas at Kalapa, the capital of Shambhala, after first receiving the Kala Chakra teaching. What is the Kala Chakra teaching? Most central to it is the correspondence between the macrocosm and the microcosm, and the correspondence between these and an ideal archetype. This ideal archetype is the Kala Chakra Mandala. A cosmogram or cosmic blueprint in the West, the correspondence between the macrocosm and the microcosm has been recognized and expressed in the often quoted axiom from the emerald tablet attributed to Hermes, as above, so below. In Kala Chakra, we have what lies behind this observed correspondence, showing the reason for it. There is an archetypal pattern behind both the macrocosm and the microcosm. These three are expressed in Kala Chakra as outer, inner, and other, where other refers to the Kala Chakra Mandala as embodying this archetypal pattern. Like the Emerald Tablets axiom, Kala Chakra too has a famous axiom teaching this. As in the outer, so in the body. As in the body, so in the other. The word body is used here for the inner because it is the inner or subtle body that forms the correspondences in the Kala Chakra system. The inner or subtle body consists of chakras or energy centers, nadis or energy channels, prana or vital airs, which are the energy winds that flow through the channels, and bindus, or drops, which are also found in the channels. As this might indicate, the Kala Chakra teaching is a very detailed and complex system. The intricate correspondences between the outer, the inner, and the other are represented in symbolic form in the archetypal pattern of the Kala Chakra Mandala. The Kala Chakra meditation practice, or sadhana, consists of visualization of the Kala Chakra Mandala in all its detail. When the correspondences are correctly known and the visualization is correctly done, the result is the purification of the outer and inner worlds. This is made possible through alignment with the archetypal pattern of the Kala Chakra Mandala. The outer, the cosmos, and the inner, the subtle bodies of human beings, together form what is called the basis to be purified. The Kala Chakra meditation practice or visualization of the other, the Kala Chakra Mandala, is called that which purifies. It is the visualization of the Kala Chakra Mandala in meditation, thereby causing alignment with the ideal pattern that brings about the purification of the outer and inner worlds. The Kala Chakra Mandala consists of three parts, known as the body mandala, the speech mandala, 
and the mind mandala. These are pictorially represented from outermost to innermost. It is through full knowledge of this threefold mandala and its correspondences that a person can bring about an alignment between the ideal archetype and the outer and inner worlds. So the Kala Chakra axiom cited above concludes with a second line. As in the outer, so in the body. As in the body, so in the other. Having understood the threefold mandala, let the teacher draw the mandala. King Suchandra of Shambhala did just that, as we learn from the stainless light Kala Chakra commentary. We read that to the south of Kalapa, the capital of Shambhala, is Malaya Park. It is between two lakes. In the middle of this park, King Suchandra constructed an extensive Kala Chakra mandala. He made it out of jewels that will last a long time. There it remains in the center of Shambhala, at the heart of our planet. It is there that, seven generations later, King Manju Sri Yashas gave the Kala Chakra initiation to the Vedic sages of Shambhala. This allowed them to undertake the Kala Chakra meditation practice, or sadhana, and they did so. At the time the Tibetan master D.K. wrote his books with Alice Bailey, it was entirely impossible to give out the specific Kala Chakra meditation practice. This practice is full of mantras and elaborate visualizations. DK told us that mantras, quote, will someday be in common use among the students of occult meditation. And that, quote, all the new processes and meditation techniques must and will embody visualization as a primary step. But he could not give us the mantras and visualizations of the Kala Chakra meditation practice. This is because initiation is required in order to undertake the practice. The publicly given Kala Chakra initiation provides permission to study this system and do its meditation practice and also protection when engaging in this study and practice. It is a powerful practice, and it has therefore long been a secret and protected practice. No one can dispense with the requirement of receiving the Kala Chakra initiation in order to undertake the Kala Chakra meditation practice, not even the sages of Shambhala. What was not possible for DK in Alice Bailey's time has become possible in our time. The present Dalai Lama's public work in the world has included giving the Kala Chakra initiation a number of times. This Maitreya-like figure, known everywhere for tirelessly teaching the religion of kindness, will be giving the Kala Chakra initiation in the U.S. Capitol Washington, D.C., in early July of this year, 2011. When the Kala Chakra initiation is given by the Dalai Lama, the Kala Chakra mandala is first prepared ahead of time. It is carefully drawn by highly skilled monks using colored sand. It is hidden behind a curtain throughout the two or three days of the Kala Chakra initiation. Then, at the end, when everyone has been initiated, the curtain is removed and they are allowed to view the Kala Chakra Mandala. It is, at that special time, a very moving sight. There, in an intricate and beautiful cosmogram, is symbolized the altogether new world that they have now been introduced into. For a thousand years, the Kala Chakra Mandala was kept secret. Only those who had received the Kala Chakra initiation could view it. Today, the Kala Chakra initiation is made available to all, and photographs of the Kala Chakra Mandala have been published for anyone to see. 
Thanks to the many efforts of the Dalai Lama and other Tibetan teachers who were obliged to leave their homeland, Kala Chakra, the teaching of Shambhala, has now come before the whole world. Could a foreknowledge that this would happen be the reason why DK regarded the teaching on Shambhala to be so important? Evidence that the Tibetan master DK would have been a Kala Chakra master in Tibet was provided in an article published in 1991 in The Beacon. The very fact that DK gave teachings on Shambhala demonstrates his connection with Kala Chakra, since Kala Chakra is the teaching of Shambhala. When he listed the teaching on Shambhala as the most important of the teachings he gave to the world, he noted that, quote, little has ever been given on this subject only the name was known, end of quote. The teaching that he gave on Shambhala describes his sacred place as the center of will and purpose on our planet. He speaks of purpose or will as the plan and of the plan as the blueprint. It is the archetypal pattern for the way things are intended to be in the life of our planet. He refers to the custodians of will or purpose at Shambhala. In short, Shambhala is the custodian of the plan. We all want to see the earth conform more closely with this ideal blueprint that we call the plan. We want our planet to be in harmony with the cosmic archetype. We all want to see the plan restored on earth. We mean it when we say the last line of the great invocation that DK gave us. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Although we cannot know the plan, it is known at Shambhala, since Shambhala is the custodian of the plan. No student of the Alice Bailey writings can miss the connection between the plan and the Kala Chakra Mandala built by King Suchandra at the capital of Shambhala. The connection of these teachings is why they would want to attend the Kala Chakra initiation. The great majority of the people who attend the publicly given Kala Chakra initiation do so for the blessing it gives them. The powerful energies that are brought in by this initiation can be felt by everyone. They do feel blessed. Tibetans who attend believe that by doing so, they will establish a karmic link with Shambhala so that they may be reborn there in the future. A small minority of the people who attend will afterwards take up the Kala Chakra meditation practice or sadhana, which this initiation gives them the permission to do. For these few, this is just the beginning. They must learn to visualize the Kala Chakra Mandala in all its intricate detail. This is not an easy practice. Moreover, its almost impenetrable symbolism turns away even some of these few in despair of ever understanding it. Those who do the practice usually do it on faith, the faith that it will lead them to enlightenment and is truly important. Like them, we too have good reason to believe that it is truly important. We know, thanks to the new teaching on Shambhala given by the Tibetan master DK, that Shambhala is the custodian of the plan, the blueprint for our planet. We know, thanks to the stainless light commentary on the Kala Chakra Tantra, that in the center of Shambhala, there is a permanent three-dimensional Kala Chakra Mandala, a cosmic blueprint. We are able, thanks to the Kala Chakra initiation given by the present Dalai Lama and others, to undertake the Kala Chakra meditation practice or sadhana in which the Kala Chakra Mandala is utilized. Through this meditation practice, the outer and inner worlds are aligned with the ideal pattern represented in the Kala Chakra Mandala. 
Now that this hitherto secret practice has become available, we can do the same thing that the kings and sages of Shambhala did. We have a truly powerful tool to restore the plan on earth. David, um, you've broken our record for uh, swiftness in the presentation. Uh, would you be open to taking a few questions? Or? Uh, yes, um, you in an article uh, drew a connection uh, between DK and his previous incarnation in which he was involved with Shambhala and the Kala Chakra in what Lamic role he fulfilled. But then you also suggested that when he gave the teachings to us through his various books, when he gave the teachings on the Antakarana meditation, he was giving us a Western version of, at least that's what I remember, a Western, a Western version of the Kala Chakra. So could you say a little bit about that? Yes, that's true. <clears throat> the Kala Chakra sadhana, or meditation that I've been speaking about, which is the visualization of the Kala Chakra mandala, which is the lengthy part of the practice, is what is called the generation stage. There is a second stage called the completion stage. It's much briefer, it comes later, and that is the six-limbed yoga. And I was making a comparison between that and the six stages of building the antakarana that DK talks about in his last book. Um, I had a question. The King Manjushri that you mentioned from Shambhala, any relationship to Manjushri, who was the Bodhisattva under Lord Buddha, along with Maitreya? Yes, it's supposed to be all the same. These kings are named because they're supposed to be incarnations of these bodhisattvas, like King Manjushri Yashas would be, in theory, an incarnation of Manjushri, the same Manjushri that you spoke of. Thank you. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> uh, in your visualization practice, uh, when you visualize a Kala Chakra Mandala, is it um, a seated visualization and construction, and therefore a concentration? Do you ever actually try to draw it? Uh, <clears throat> you're, the teachers are supposed to be able to draw it. And the monks of the Namgyal Monastery of the Dalai Lama come with him on the, when he goes to give the initiation, they draw it. But yes, there's a whole science to drawing it. It's in the third chapter of the Kala Chakra Tantra. Every detail, you can't make any mistakes. And uh, it's very, very precise. Yes, it's seeded. And it's also seeded in the meditation because you use seed syllables to generate everything in it. Uh, David, can you say anything about the connection of the, uh, the Maitreya with Shambhala? I don't know of a direct connection, but I would make one. <laughs> because of the coming of the energies of Maitreya at the same time that the college was coming out, that's enough for me. <laughs> uh, David, in your, sorry, you, you finished? In your, in your uh, 1990 article in, uh, in the Beacon, you were talking about um, uh, Alice Bailey's teachings, the Tibetan's teachings, and the secret doctrine uh, comprising three-fifths of the Kala Chakra initiation teachings. Can you comment on that? And also the second part, uh, the astrological aspect of the, of the Kala Chakra wheel. Yeah, the reason I said that is that the subject matter <coughs> is between DK's treatise on the seven rays in five volumes and the five chapters of the Kala Chakra Tantra overlap by three. Can't quite do that, but so that the first two volumes of a treatise on the seven rays, which deal with esoteric psychology, would be giving the introduction to tantric theory in general, the rays, the Johnny Buddha families. Then 
the third volume of a treatise on the seven rays is esoteric <coughs> astrology. And the first chapter of the Kala Chakra Tantra is the Loka Dhatu Patala, the one on the world. And it includes an extensive astronomy section. I hate to call it astrology because most of it has to do with astronomical calculations. Nonetheless, it's not pure astronomy either because it's describing an inner zodiac that happens inside your body too, not only the outer one. So there's that connection. Then the fourth volume of DK's Treatise on the Seven Rays, of course, is Esoteric Healing. The second chapter of the Kala Chakra Tantra is on the, the Adyatma, the inner, that, that deals with the subtle body that I mentioned. And from this information, and uh, a system of medicine has arisen in Tibet. Likewise, from the information in the astronomy portion of the first chapter, a system of astrology in Tibet has arisen. Then the fifth volume of DK's treatise on the seven rays, the rays and the initiations, the third chapter of the Kala Chakra Tantra is actually titled Initiation. Now again, there's not any direct or clear overlap between the initiation spoken of there, which is the initiation that anybody who will attend in July will be receiving, and DK's initiations. They're not you can make whatever correspondences you want, but it's not a clear one-on-one -on -one by any means. So the other two-fifths of the teaching would, would be embodied in meditation, rituals, and mantras? That's right. Oh. The fourth chapter is the sadhana, which DK couldn't give. That's mm. the actual meditation instructions. Mm. And then the fifth is the really esoteric stuff that I think nobody understands on earth practically, perhaps maybe DK, so on jnana uh, wisdom highest wisdom and it gives all these mantric correspondences with everything that uh, I mean there's a tiny percentage of Tibetans that do it and of that tiny perception maybe one understands that chapter it's tough uh -huh. <laughs> have you noticed any uh, correlation between Vazubandhu and the Tattva Tathagata uh, Samgraha and Yes, I have. Uh, Vasubandhu is, of course, one of the three main yoga chara teachers of the t Tibetan Buddhist, I mean, the northern Mahayana Buddhist tradition, along with his older brother, Asanga, and their teacher, Maitreya. So there is that another connection there. But uh, the yoga chara ideas, the alaya vijnana, the, um, the foundation consciousness, the world soul, so to speak, um, that is part of Kala Chakra. Yes, so there's, it's not a direct connection because Kala Chakra didn't appear in India until 500 years after Vasubandhu's time. But it's, there's a connection at least in the teaching. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs>